Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the podcast, Porn Brain Rewire, with me, Dr. Trish Lee. Today, I am really excited to have a special guest. Uh, Mary Jo Rapini is here. We are going to break down the topics that I know you have been wanting to know the answers to. And here we're going to have a dialogue and a discussion. Um, before we started recording, I said to Mary Jo, some of the answers I think from both of us, you will be expecting, others you will not. So you make sure, you know, you want to make sure you stay tuned till the end of this podcast. So without further ado, Mary Jo, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Yeah, me too. And if you could just for a minute, tell people kind of your background and uh, what your deal is, that would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, I'm a psychologist. I work in Houston, Texas, and I work with urology and with oncology uh, because many people that are struggling with sexuality, I work a lot with sexuality and intimacy in relationships come through those two types of physicians. Basically, much of my job with the urologist is, is doing cognitive behavioral therapy with young men who are porn addicted. They're in their mm -hmm. early 20s and they can't achieve an erection with a partner in a stable relationship. It goes okay for a while, but usually they pull back, they're aloof, they can't maintain an erection because what they tell me is it's not stimulating enough. It's not a variety. And so I've been so intrigued by this topic because many of my single friends also are dating people. And what they're finding out is that those people are elusive in, in relationships. They seem like they're afraid to be intimate emotionally, and they really aren't able to sustain any kind of a sexual relationship. We didn't, even we didn't even have that on the docket. I think we have to cancel the docket. No, I'm only kidding. We will definitely get to the, but I've been focused on erectile dysfunction now for about six months. Um, oh, okay. I've been, and you and I haven't even talked about this. I have right. a digital program for erectile dysfunction coming out soon. And oh, then great. my, my neurofeedback coaching program that I offer, I've been primarily focusing on young men, young and middle-aged men with mm -hmm. erectile dysfunction. So, oh, that's wonderful. because what you're seeing, I'm seeing, and mm -hmm. I know it's arousal dysfunction in the brain, which is why you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting. Uh, we're on the same wavelength in terms of all of that. So very interesting. Yeah. Dr. Lee, I was going to talk to you too about what are other methods of treatment? And I know we should go through the parts of it first, but I really am curious because a lot of my patients, when they, they're they not real responsive to cognitive therapy alone, and they're looking for something else, what is the treatment? Well, this that is the you know million dollar question. And it's mm -hmm. really interesting. I have been trying to put this program out for about three months. I started researching it maybe like nine months ago or so. And I thought I'd be able to put this program together quickly, a digital program. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you've met me, I like to bring big value to people in the digital program by being able to bring together all the resources that a person can tap into. The problem is I haven't been able to find a ton of them besides neurofeedback, which is which is the service that I offer. And I don't want to put out a digital program that leads people to my personal service. Like that feels out of integrity to me. Mm -hmm. And so I've been sitting on this amazing program that I put together. The program that I've basically put together is it's very long too. I've recorded it three times and it has not felt right to me. So I haven't put it out. It's very long describing the problem to people. Because Absolutely. as the discussion, you know, as you and I keep discussing mm -hmm. this, the problem is exactly what you already said. It's arousal dysfunction in the brain from a person's brain going back to high dopamine producing activities, aka porn, sexual acting out in a multitude of different ways that mm -hmm. is not within a healthy, intimate relationship. So when you keep going back to those activities, your brain gets all this dopamine it desensitizes the reward center in the brain. So the solution is to resensitize the reward center in the brain and to make sure you're not desensitizing it anymore. 
And so really? finding other modalities that resensitize a reward center has been very difficult for me. I have not been able to. And it's interesting because the problem is too much dopamine. So most of most treatment modalities in general in the whole world increase dopamine. Oh. Where yeah. what that's the problem. The solution has to be able to decrease the need for dopamine while bringing down the brain pattern that's been caused by too much dopamine. So I found a few things, but um, I've been working with a lot of people with erectile dysfunction and they are, you know, healing their brains very quickly with neurofeedback. So that's why I'm like, I just have to double down on letting people know if you want this thing solved quickly, this is the solution. Right. Wow. That is really incredible. I, you know, I'm talking to a lot of clients who I believe are porn addicted, but yeah. they are resistant to taking that title. Like they, they'll make excuses. How do you know? Like, how can we tell for sure if one of my clients who's dating someone or um, a good friend, you know, tells us the symptoms of this is the thinking. tricky part. This is the such the tricky part is that mm -hmm. the people who are affected by porn, right? Don't know. It's not like they're holding it back from you. You would have to know how to ask the right questions and they would have to be willing to answer those questions uh, truthfully and authentically. And it really is about behaviors. But, you know, my friends joke now that they have porn radar, porn dar, you know, because. <laughs> Yeah. When they meet people, they'll be like, that guy definitely watches a ton of porn. And that's not with judgment. That's like, because when now they know what to look for behaviorally, yeah. a person who sexualizes all the time, you know, like in a conversation, it's just goes sexual. Right. And this is a behavior that happens because they, there's just sex on the brain. They don't even mean to. Mm -hmm. Like it's just oh, in yeah. there. Mm -hmm. And I told a gentleman yesterday he asked me a bunch of questions and I'm like, and I kind of chuckled and I'm like, again, this comes with no judgment. I'm like, everything you just asked me was from the perspective of the hijacker. I call porn addiction, the hijacker in your brain. I love that. And it's literally and like it your is. brain, it is, you, your brain's been hijacked. It's, mm -hmm. it is operating in a new mode and that new mode makes you think different things and do different things that you would have done had you never watched porn and masturbated. Mm. And this is what I said to the gentleman, because he's basically like, you know, I'm not addicted to porn. I only watch it, you know, one time a month, two times a month. My partner knows about it, um, you know. So it's like having a drink one or two times a month. And I'm like, I need to stop you right there. It's like having heroin one or two times a month. So let's call a spade a spade. Let's not call it a beer, let's call it right. heroin because it damages your brain to the extent that heroin would. It's like, okay, touche on that one. Yeah. And then, you know, then the conversation develops and he tells me he basically can't stop masturbating. Mm. So like if, and a, a, a man's most likely not going to admit that to you. Yeah. And that, that masturbation has become compulsive, like that he needs to do it to regulate his mood. And yeah. so I've had thousands of these conversations. I know that men don't know because one gentleman asked me, he's like, you know, I haven't watched porn in a year. You know, why isn't my brain healed? Talked to him for a long time. At the end of the conversation, he's like, he wanted to know something about prostitutes. And I'm like, wait a minute. You stopped watching porn a year ago, but you're telling me you are currently still with prostitutes. <laughs> like, not at all putting these two behaviors, mm -hmm. connecting them on a continuum. And just to wrap it up for one more second, then I'll throw it back to you is that this thing exists on a continuum. So okay. it's easy to see like in a person that is just sexualizing the conversation all the time and you see them check out every woman that goes by, um, you know, and they might even admit, but you know, in a person who only watches porn a little bit and masturbates, you know, once a week, but they don't get that that's compulsive mm -hmm. because it's been normalized in society so much. And you know, that it's down on this side of the continuum. It can be tricky to identify unless the person is ready 
to figure it out. That's right. I, you know, I'm assuming it's like other addictions and that the denial is what keeps it going. And that also there is no cure for, so you're always in a state of recovery. Is that correct? I would disagree. And this is going to be one of those answers that most people, some people will, um, I don't like to use the word argue, but contend in a different direction. So this is what I know about porn addiction recovery. Okay. is that it is a personal transformation journey. Like, and I might say the same about other addictions, but this is my standpoint. And, you know, remembering that I have the ability to look at neurological function yes. in people. So my standpoint's uh-huh. a little bit different because of what I already told you. If you're addicted to porn, it's because your brain pattern changed when you were young in adolescence. So your brain okay. never fully developed. Because you started watching porn and masturbating when you were young, it became a dependency. It changed the homeostasis in your brain. Right. So your brain literally never fully developed over time. So Mm. unless you change that, then you may stay a person with an addiction. But if you embark on a comprehensive recovery program, what should happen is you unwire, you know, these are the words I use, but... You change the way that your brain is performing, you unwire it, and then you rewire it and you set into motion the flywheel of it catching up with development and then learning how to grow your emotional intelligence, learning how to develop intimacy. So if you heal your brain and you actually embark on the personal transformation journey that's necessary, in the end, you're performing different neurologically. And you have a whole new set of tools to deal with your life. Like you're literally a new person. Oh, so that, that is a person who is recovered. Right. But if, if they were exposed to porn again, I assume they would fall back into that pattern quicker than most likely. Ever. Yeah. And so, that that's proven in the brain too, too, that there are, is a transcription factor in the brain that basically mm-hmm. the way I talk about it is like, if you've watched porn and masturbated for a long time, right. those neural pathways, they've laid some concrete on them. Mm-hmm. So are those neural pathways still in there? Yes, because they were concreted. But if you stop using those neural pathways and you start using the new healthy ones, yes. those pathways will completely weed over. And you know how like, if you're on a path and grass grows between the cracks and like you can yes. hardly see the pavement. Yeah. You'll hardly be able to see that pavement. But if you start to walk on that path again, you're going to trample those weeds down and underneath it is the concrete and it will fire back up much more quickly. That's why it's essential that a person hardwires the new brain pattern into their brain and sets a foundation for a recovered life. So they oh. never go back. And if you can do that, then you become a person who's recovered, not a person who has to stay in recovery forever. Oh, well, that's, see, that's really optimistic. How long do you think the majority of people would need to stay in a treatment? It's, that's tricky. There's so many variables and I was going to try and to throw out like a good number, but honestly, I can't even do it. But that's okay. why, you know, most treatment, like my, my digital program's 90 days. Uh-huh. And this is what okay. I tell people. And this is the truth is mm-hmm. that 90 days later, you will have had the opportunity if you make it through the program. And I'm not, and if you're in my program, listen up, because I'm always looking to see what percentage of the program people have completed. Right. Yeah. So that's variable number one. So, yeah. and then how a person engages is variable number two. Uh But like, if you move through a program and you actually engage with it and you're, you're figuring out all the things you need to explore and resolve, and then you're building skills the whole time. Right. So if you actually move through that 90 day program, 90 days later, you should have a full understanding of all the pieces that you've resolved yourself and Mm -hmm. the pieces that are left that you need to keep working on. And you should be able to, because your self-awareness has increased, be able to go, can I work on these last pieces myself or do I need support in doing it? Mm -hmm. And if a person does that, like, you know, you know, the joke in recovery, the joke in recovery is, you know, as soon as you realize you 
need support for the rest of your life, that's when you're recover. You've begun to recover. Exactly. As because soon as you, you don't want to be out of it. <laughs> right. You know, I, I'm curious about this and I don't know if you have any ideas when you, you say that when the porn starts, usually at a young age, that it stunts your brain's growth. Well, you know, in relationships, part of becoming a full adult is you realize that intimacy is more than sex. There's a spiritual component an intellectual component, sharing adventures and experiences, all these ways to get closer to your partner. Do those areas stunt as well? Definitely. And a huge part of my program is increasing emotional intelligence. And the four mm. pillars of emotional intelligence are self-awareness, uh -huh. self-regulation, oh, social relationship awareness, and social relationship management. So that's exactly what you talked about. And actually, there's a big lesson on all the different types of intimacies mm -hmm. that a person needs to figure out and start embarking on. Yes. Just to make one more comment about that is that like what I also try to teach people about is Maslow's hierarchy of needs because you're yes. talking about that. And when a person's brain development is stunted, as is their emotional intelligence, they get stuck in the lowest levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in a very distorted way. So at the bottom is sex for reproduction. That's a bottom level need, which obviously evolutionarily keeps our, our people, you know, continuing into the right. future, but it's distorted because sex isn't being, being enjoyed with a partner. It's being used for self comfort, comfort and self soothing. So yeah. now what happens is you're stuck in the very lowest levels of self actualization, which is your ability to become the best version of yourself. Right. So like a person's full potential is stunted by this. And I want people to know that because you're stuck in the lowest levels of your full potential because of a distorted relationship to self sex. Right. And the very top level is self actualization is you figure out what your purpose is here on planet earth in terms of being able to serve humanity in a really meaningful way but also to enjoy your life to the, the biggest extent. That's Absolutely. what the top level is. And you will not get there if you're just feeding the loop in the lowest levels. So I think we've just identified another area that if you're dating, if you're modern dating and on social, you know, on dating apps, one thing you could look for is their ability to to know themselves, to be self-aware, how well they can carry on a conversation. Because I don't know about yours, Dr. Lee, but my clients that come in that have a porn addiction, they also are very socially regressed. They're nervous, they're anxious. It's obvious they, have, they lack self-awareness, they lack self-control, mm -hmm. and they're using porn as an outlet. It becomes mm -hmm. so- First easy. two pillars, first two pillars yeah. of- Emotional intelligence. Yep. Right. And so in most of the time when these people take their their new date to a restaurant with friends or to home to meet the parents, the first thing the parents or the friends will say is they're so weird. And they're using <laughs> that as a big word describing they're so uncomfortable in their own skin. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that is an important point. It doesn't mean everybody you meet like that is mm -hmm. a porn addict. But right. if everything else is checked off the box mm -hmm. and you're like, why do they hold back? Why are they, why are they so needy of their own time or so ashamed if they, you catch them seeing something mm -hmm. that, yeah. that could be an answer or at least. Yeah. And that's what I was just going to say is that goes back to their brain function. Like mm -hmm. their brain is not functioning at its highest level of capacity and we know, I know from the brain pattern that is created by porn consumption, we don't even have to, in the word addiction, like, you know how we're like kind of hung up on that, that I don't oh. even love that word. If you're consuming porn, like, you know, hear mm -hmm. me on that. You don't have to call yourself addicted to porn. If you are consuming porn with any level of frequency, consistency, and definitely intensity, you qualify in this problematic porn use is what they call mm -hmm. it. Oh, Okay. And because so, I like, heard, you know, oh, I'm sorry. I've heard 
experts say that, you know, we're calling too many people a porn addict. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know the basis of that. I do know there's like a checklist of mm -hmm. who is a porn addict. Yeah, and which I disagree. I disagree with, I, I think just about everybody, anybody who watches porn is likely addicted. Oh, see, I talk about that because mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Cause if you Google the checklist, mm -hmm. it's like, do you spend time thinking about porn? Exactly. <laughs> Do you lose track of time when uh -huh. you're on porn? Do you, is it something you're embarrassed about or shameful? Those mm -hmm. kinds of questions. And I'm thinking to myself, well, people could lie about every one of these. Do you ever lie about it? Is one of the questions. Is one of the questions. Yeah, definitely. And it's funny because I put a video out with that checklist and uh -huh. all the comments they're like, and actually in that checklist, you only have to qualify for one Oh my Not all of them, goodness. one. So oh. it's like, if you meet the one of these requirements, you likely have a problem with porn. And, you know, all the comments are like, oh. I have all six of them describe me. And I'm like, you know, so because that is the nature of porn news. And the way that I talk about it is there's no horizontal spiral when it comes mm -hmm. to porn. You're either in a downward spiral or an upward spiral. Because if you keep using it, there's tolerance building your brain changes again and needs more dopamine, which mm -hmm. means the downward spiral continues. And porn sites are acutely aware of this. And that's how they bait people into more intense scenes to give them more dopamine to keep the downward spiral going. Mm -hmm. So like, that's why when that guy and I talked to him yesterday and he's like, I only watch it one time a month, maybe two like right now, that's what I said to him. Like right now you might, but if you keep watching it one to two times a month, call me back in three years and you'll, you'll be at one time a week because that's how it goes. Like yeah, no horizontal spiral. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people only after they're caught in the trap of porn or the downward spiral, do they realize the more you get into porn, the narrower your life, your options aren't opening. You're getting more socially withdrawn, more lonely, more depressed. And this is actually why many people, young men, especially who are suicidal, they also have a flaring porn addiction. Yeah, and I work, maybe, unfortunately, I, I work with a lot of people who were, thank God, uh, um, not that I want, you know, were suicidal. And so when I talk to someone in consults and they're like, I've had suicidal thoughts before, I'm like, you need to do a brain map with me. And oh. I can see their brains are on fire. Oh, and honestly, well. you know what I was going to say? And I'm sure I'll probably frustrate some people, but here it goes anyways, is that, uh -huh. you know, that could be the blessing or the benefit of ED because your oh. body is screaming at you. You have a problem, my friend, and you can't mm -hmm. ignore it. The other things are a little easier to ignore because nobody connects the dots or picks up those breadcrumbs from what they're experiencing back to porn use. It's very difficult to do that. It really is. Right. Like, you know, you have depression. Most people don't know that depression is associated with porn. But if you have ED now, and actually a lot of people tell me, they're like, I saw your video on, a, on ED. Like, mm -hmm. I had no idea that it was in my brain. And a lot of people do go to urologists. Urologists don't even know that it's arousal dysfunction. Exactly. And they'll give them meds. They'll give them testosterone and other meds as well, Cialis, and uh, to uh, help uh, them medicate the problem uh, at that time. But that, pro that symptom is bigger. It's relying on what you're watching and what's happening to you. It is. So it's screaming at you. You need to fix this. Yeah. You need to stop. And, mm -hmm. and so like your body is telling you, and, you know, I thought that way about symptoms for a long time uh -huh. is that if you have a symptom, like it's calling to you to change something, you know, so you have to figure out what is it, where is it coming from? And, you know, that's that when it comes to looking at a brain map, like the brain map actually shows, look how far, look how much dysfunction is in your brain. Like when people see it, they're like, wow. Because mm -hmm. it's easy to see this is the reason why you're having arousal issues. And I've been using the word arousal a lot lately um, to, to articulate like just your ability to interact with your life, not just sexual mm -hmm. arousal, but right. arousal means you get up and healthy arousal is you're calm, 
and you're yeah. focused and you're jazzed up to have a great day. Mm -hmm. And so if you do that, your brain's in a good mode. But right. like most people struggle with anxiety, brain fog, overwhelm, exhaustion, fatigue. Like if you struggle with any of those things, your brain's operating in the extremes. And mm -hmm. then those things go along with ED. ED is the physical symptom. Those are the cognitive and the mental symptoms. Right. And is there a personality profile or is it genetic? Where, how do we know? Sure. So um, I don't love to use the word genetic. Um, I use the word familial, even oh, though, okay. you know, science will show that there is a quote unquote genetic component. Right. But this is what I want people to know. There's a big corpus of literature on epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And epi means above your genetics. And we know now that if you do all the right stuff in terms of your health and you mm -hmm. stop doing the wrong stuff, you can rise above what your genes or what your family gave you. Right. And you know, I tell people, mom and dad, if you're listening, I'm sorry, but I tell people, you know, I have five brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and my parents and I've seen their brains. They have oh. brains on fire. And okay. I started living my life differently than my family. It's funny. My younger sister and I were trying to figure it out. Like she made a comment not long ago. And she's like, that's when my whole family calls me Trisha, which is so weird. I have never called myself Trisha. I don't remember. I go by Trish. Uh huh. And I went back to see them. I'm like, why do you all call me Trisha? Like, and then I'm like, when did I go from Trisha to Trish? And my sister said, probably about the time you started to change. Yeah. <laughs> and, wow. and I was very young, but like in, inside of me, I'm like, I'm not going to live this lifestyle. I live a much different, like, you know, I eat differently. I exercise all the time. I don't have negative thoughts. I've mm -hmm. developed strategies to when difficult things come at me, I feel it. I don't ignore it. I make an action plan. I give myself rest within that. Like, you know, that's, strong, healthy, emotional intelligence, right? Been developing probably now for literally 35 years, you know? So, mm -hmm. so the point is I rose above my genetics, right? So there's a familial component, but you can rise above that. So if you're telling you, if anybody tells themselves, my dad watched porn, everybody in my family has addictions, you can rise above that. I want you to know that your brain can change. The reason that genetic component exists is because brains don't fall far from the tree. Our right. brain performance pattern is similar to our family, but you make new choices, you do new things, you get new outcomes. And the second part in terms of personality is a really cool question. Personality, um, I offer in my 90 day program, I teach people how to take a personality test mm -hmm. and to use the personality test to develop something I call a fault line. Oh. So I use the Enneagram. And if you're listening, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to go to truity.com, T-R-U-I-T-Y. I actually haven't checked in a while, but they have always offered a free Enneagram test. Ennea means nine. There's nine different personality types. I've looked at the science behind it. It has efficacy to being able to you know, nail you right. in terms right. of, and it's really powerful. So mm -hmm. there are one or two types, and I'll tell you which types those are that are more at risk for porn mm -hmm. addiction. But what's even more important is that within the nine types, there's nine levels of integration or disintegration for each personality type. Wow. So what that means is, there's nine levels of health and stress is the thing that makes you disintegrate. Mm. So stress is like, it's going to take people out. Stress is the number one reason people watch porn. Stress is why you devolve in your emotional intelligence and the way you interact with the world, because you just literally can't handle it anymore. The higher the emotional intelligence you have, the more you can handle in the world. That's a fact. Yeah. So like, I can handle, I've handled the craziest difficult things because I've been working on my emotional intelligence. And well, you I have to be self-aware to do that. That and, is it. it self-awareness is the first step in emotional right. intelligence. Yep. And so I can see why people get trapped in the stress with porn because they're losing one of the most essential things to, to learn self-coping 
skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. honestly, stress hasn't really changed. It's our reaction to it, right? It is. And, so and I, it's, the life, it's the lifestyles that we put ourselves in. But like, I, I find it so interesting. I've been spending a ton of money on accident because I have five beautiful children that yeah. just started school. Like, oh, yeah. I am mm -hmm. like, I, I'm like kids. And this is one of my fault lines. Oh, I'm yeah. a type five. Type five avarice is avarice mm -hmm. meaning they never feel like they have enough resources yes and so when the word spending freeze comes out of my mouth you know i'm devolving oh but this is the point like i accidentally keep putting myself in positions where i'm kind of self-sabotaging by doing the very thing that's gonna make me devolve <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah, I think that's all of us, right? We it's all of us. That. It's all of yes. us. And that's why I encourage people to find their fault line behavior. What mm -hmm. is it that you can, it can jolt you awake. It, it starts raising the red flags. For me, when I'm super busy in my schedule and I keep scheduling things, boom, red flag. Mm -hmm. I'm out of control because I'm so stressed out. I'm just piling things on my plate. So well, I'm in hardcore survival mode to keep going. Yes. It's my schedule and spending. Like if mm -hmm. I am overspending or even if I just, sometimes my spending doesn't change at all. Just my perception of money changes. Exactly. And even though my spending has it, I'm like, yes. kids, we're on a spending freeze. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, <laughs> don't ask questions. Just don't buy anything on Amazon. <laughs> so, and that's just because I feel stressed. I've just devolved. Mm -hmm. And when that word comes out, I'm like, I have to sit quietly with myself for an hour and figure out what is making me feel this way. Yeah. And, and that's the self-awareness piece. You can't be self-aware if you're watching porn all the time, it's designed mm -hmm. to make you not self-aware, right? Sitting in your comfy chair with your journal and a cup of tea or sit on, I sit on my back porch in the morning. It's still dark. I sit out there for like mm -hmm. till the sun rises, you know, and I have to get the kids ready for school, but it's silent. I become aware of my feelings, all the stuff running through my mind. I write down because that's the stuff I got to work on because that's running in my background. Yeah. Every morning I allow, you know, an hour, 45 minutes to an hour of self-awareness so I mm -hmm. can stay on track. Wow. That is a really, I think if everybody just started doing that, maybe not early in the morning, maybe at night, mm -hmm. but just sitting mm -hmm. still with a journal would go a long way in helping you understand the process of what's happening to you right now. Yeah. And you have to know what to look for. What to look yeah. for is what's running in your background. Mm -hmm. I love the Write way them you down. said that. Yep. Write and that's them down. Those, those crazy thoughts, like those monkey mind thoughts that just keep coming in. When mm -hmm. you write them down, they're going to come into the head less. And you're yeah. going to catharse those by putting them on paper. It is. It's a brain dump. And neuroscience mm -hmm. shows if you write things down, you process and integrate them better. So that's why I tell people, like, I know, especially men, they're like, I don't use a journal. I'm like, yeah. now you do. <laughs> yeah. Get a nice one. I always tell people, get a pleather journal, get a really nice pen. So you mm -hmm. feel good about doing it. And you don't have to write, dear diary, today I'm feeling. Right. What you do is sit there and the thought comes into your mind and you write it down. Mm -hmm. And the next thought, but then you look down and, and like something so simple. I bought this electric bike uh -huh. and it died. We had it for like a month and it died. It's been sitting in the garage. It was very expensive. Mm -hmm. Every day I'm thinking about that electric bike. It's right. like, you know, I, I'm not solving world peace or anything. I just need <laughs> uh -huh. that electric bike out of my background. Right. Right. So when, and I did that like two weeks ago, all the little things that were accumulating into a huge pile in my mind. Mm -hmm. I wrote them all down and I started acting. And this is another thing. If you're, if you're used to going into the screen to escape your stressors, approaching and engaging acting is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So you have to make yourself do it. It's like, no, 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 I'm not going to escape these feelings. I'm going to look at them. Then I'm going to approach and engage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to return this electric buck and then I'm going to do the next thing that came into my mind. Sometimes those things are bigger. It's having a discussion with your partner about your lack of a sex life. You know, right. and I know we want to talk about that too. Or I'll tell people like, if every day you you're telling yourself that you're using porn because your wife won't be with you. Like, no, that's not a thing. I tell people, 
a one gentleman, he's like, we haven't had sex in 20 years. Oh. I'm like, dude, this, you need to have this conversation today because it's 19 years, 364 days late. <laughs> yep. I, I just, can you imagine? I mean, I, that's how it robs you of life. That's how it limits you. But I like the idea of an action plan and nobody likes to do the action plan. Honestly, the action plan is something you write down and you will yourself to do it that day. Mm -hmm. Something and then, important. then you check it off. You put a check mark because science shows you check that baby off. Guess what your brain just got? Dopamine. Wow. You get a dopamine hit in your actual life by checking off the things you need to do. So instead of giving your brain way too much dopamine from the screen, which is giving you erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. you just rewired your brain back into your life to get a little dopamine hit by starting to check things off the box. And they don't feel good in the moment, but that check mark, that check mark feels good. And it's moving you forward in, in climbing up Maslow's, you know, hierarchy, getting up there okay. to the top of the pyramid. Right. And something as simple as that action can change a whole relationship. Okay. I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what, how porn betrays your partner, your life, your re any relationship you have. Yeah. And it betrays yourself first and foremost. And I run a, a program for partners called Sanity mm -hmm. After Betrayal. Uh -huh. And and that program for partners, you know, people assume they're betrayed by their, their porn watching partner. Right. When I'm talking to partners, I'm like, no, you betrayed yourself by not loving and respecting yourself above your partner. Because a lot of times partners don't want to move towards conflict, right. but you know, so first and foremost is, and I teach this in my 90 day program. First and foremost, when you watch porn, it's betrayal of your capital S self. So that's the true authentic self that would have existed at the top of Maslow's hierarchy, your self-actualized full potential, butt kicking, rocking out your best life self. That's who you are first and foremost betraying. And you know it which is why you keep going back into the screen because of the shame of betraying the version that you want to be. But porn so addictive, you can't help but keep going back until you get into a program. That's what happens for right. most people. Mm -hmm. So this is what I want you to know uh, about relationships. This is crazy. And this is an answer that you probably aren't expecting is mm -hmm. that we already established most men find porn in adolescence. Right. So they've brought porn into a relationship. So they have not betrayed you through porn use. They've betrayed you in honesty. Yes. So I like, because that. porn use was always there. So like mm -hmm. their porn use is not about you at all. And it's actually your sexuality. All of that is actually not the main thing. And so when partners feel upset about being betrayed, they, the actual feeling that they have is that they didn't do what they should have done for themselves back when they became acutely aware their partner was not being honest with them. Yeah. And so when I work with men, I tell men, I, you, this is what I usually tell men. You need to get into the 90 day program, start moving through it and gain sobriety from porn. Because mm -hmm. I definitely don't want you to go tell your partner at this moment. Like some people have been married for 25 years. I don't want you to go tell your wife I've been watching porn for the last 25 years. It will not go over and you will have a bigger chasm. Mm -hmm. But if you start working on it and then you say to her, and she probably already knows or her spider senses yes. have been tangling around it. You say, I've had a problem with porn, but I've been working on it for mm -hmm. 30 days and I'm doing well. It's difficult, yada, yada. Like what that man has just done is let their partner in crime, the person they're supposed to be engaging in this life, right? Side by side, you just let your wife into the real you. She's been with a fake you for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And women don't want a fake version of you. Right. They, most women, 99 out of 100 women, can show up for the difficult stuff that is involved in porn addiction. Like I've seen it over and over again. If they understand the working parts, and it, there's a lot of hurt and damage that's been done. But yeah. most women are like, I get it. This is an addiction. I get it. It was there before. 
I really don't like all these behaviors, but like, I'm so glad that now I know the real version and I want to start a life with the real version. Right. Do women go through this thing or the partner, whoever that is, where they blame themselves? Are you able to tell them? Because I would think that if you are dating someone and you find out or you've been with them for a year only to find out then that they're actually addicted to porn, mm -hmm. that you would feel so stupid and humiliated. Like I believed in you. I believed in us. And now mm -hmm. you've been lying about this. Yeah. And that's the tricky part with intimacy mm -hmm. that, and in the sanity after betrayal program, I have a digital program for that. I walk mm -hmm. women through because that is what happens for most women. Like yeah. first there's blame themselves and their partner. And honestly, I don't even think your partner's to blame. That's, you know, part of the surprising answer too, because this is an addiction. It's very difficult when a person realizes they have an out of control behavior. The first thing that they want to do is not tell anybody. <laughs> right. Because they're ashamed of it. Right. Because there's I, so I, much shame. So like yes. even the dishonesty isn't totally their fault because most men who have developed this porn habit over time have actually developed so many coping mechanisms of lying, manipulating, yes. like it's actually, you know, it can be very abusive to a partner emotionally, but it's actually mm -hmm. not about the partner. It's about all the defense mechanisms that the man has established. But right. there's so much betrayal, like betrayal of self for, for both people, mm -hmm. kind of betrayal, definite betrayal feelings of honesty. Yeah. And, you know, a partner feels like partners. It's interesting because some of them are actually most women will kind of go through all of these stages. I think uh -huh. first there's blame being mad. It's kind of like all the grieving stages to right. a certain extent. Denial, you know, like it's not as big. Then they'll try to have triple the amount of crazy sex with their partner, trying to yes. make up for it and be, there's no way they can do it. There's no way it's not about that. So there's no way they can compete with what porn offers, but then women will move through these stages. And finally they'll come to this understanding that this isn't about me at all. It's about him. And I need to set a boundary. Like I'm not being with a person who's not being honest with me. Right. That's when the self betrayal ends. And I want partners to get there as soon as possible where they're like, I'm going to love and respect myself over anybody else's needs because usually they don't want to approach their partner because first of all, they don't have the emotional intelligence going back, right. to having the skills to have that conversation exactly. without freaking out. And secondarily, they don't know how to go. I love you, but I can't be with you if you're not going to be honest. And, you know, either you get into a program, we start working on this together or I'm out of here in 30 days. And I don't want to leave. I want to do this journey with you, but I can't do it for you. Right. And there probably there's so much fear, right? Especially if you have kids with this person or all this. How long do you think it is from the beginning of porn to being honest about it that you have an addiction? It usually is. It's it could be a lifetime. Again, there's no answer oh, for that, really? but it's long. It's long. Most oh. men don't know. Like at you know, right now it's 2023 20, as of this recording. Yes. People just don't know. They don't know. They're using a lot of porn. They're masturbating mm -hmm. all the time. And they just simply don't understand because part of that defense mechanism is compartmentalization. So mm -hmm. the rationalization of the compartmentalization started when they were 12 with their right. adolescent underdeveloped brain that never made it all the way into adulthood. Oh, like it's just is yeah. what it is. Like mm -hmm. that's why I, I love the way you said that. Like, like, I just want people to understand the complexity of this thing. That's mm -hmm. why I started making videos because I wanted people to know this is a thing and it is so complex neurologically, psychologically, cognitively. It is like, I believe it to be like the trickiest thing that's out there to understand and escape. Right. Well, because it's so supported, it's a billion dollar industry and organizations like Pornhub and some of these others that are just feeding it and many of oh, them that's money they're making a ton I'm, of money in oh every everybody involved in it so if nothing else I would try to help a partner who has a porn addiction just so they don't become part of the stew 
I'll I know. Go. And I, I never even go there. I never even go there because I'm like, I've got too many missions. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> like, just wait to, like, to me, that's it's, like more of like, I started to get involved with sex trafficking organizations yeah. that go mm-hmm. against, you know, right. and I'm like, I can't, I just literally can't do that. That kind of wounds me. And yes. I find it. It's, and it's I'm like, I'm not it. even going to try to go against the man. Right. Like the way I see it is if every one person that I can help, mm-hmm. the ripple effect out from them is massive. So even if I help one person, it helps their partner. It helps their children. It literally helps generations to come in their family by yeah. increasing emotional intelligence and breaking the chains of this thing. So it's like exactly. I'm on a mission to help as many individuals and to create that ripple effect that I know will make a big change. And I'm hoping it's going to be like smoking where, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the industry made it so that they were kind of keeping people blind to all the dangers of smoking. But once the masses or once people kind of hit a tipping point of understanding all the problems that were happening because of it, Yes. people just stop smoking. Yes. And so then, you know, now there's very few people who continue to smoke. Right. They do so knowing the dangers, but the vast majority don't smoke and don't want to be around anybody who smokes. Mm-hmm. And so it might take 50, 60, 70 years. I'm, I'll probably be dead before that happens. But yeah, to be part of that, like helping people understand and then giving them the tools to stop is really important to me. And and I believe that that shift will happen into the future. And already so much science is coming out. And, you know, just from the increased people that we're beginning to help. Yeah, I know we'll hit that tipping point sometime. I love that. And I think that's a great place to end because we understand that the healthier the couple, the healthier the children, the healthier the communities. So getting porn use under control, treating it, and being able to face life without it, I think is the freest. Yeah, enjoy life. Like I think the reason, I know the reason is there's a dopamine deficit in people's lives. Your lives are being ruined by porn. You won't even have to face life anymore. You can grab it by the horns and, you know, get out there. And, and, you know, on one last note, and then we'll wrap it up is that, Uh you know, if you can't do this alone, most people can't. Mm -hmm. And actually I just recorded a podcast on porn addiction resources because I saw that that's a high search uh, volume, which I loved that people are looking for resources for porn Mm -hmm. addiction is that, you know, using free content like this is great, but hopefully it inspires you to get into a program or to get into care with a mental health professional who knows how to help you. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't do it alone, this is very difficult. Most people can't. They need the tools and techniques and the support to be able to move through, to get to the other side, to become recovered, not in recovery forever, mm-hmm. to be recovered and to have the foundation. So, you know, I hope that people are inspired by our conversation to be able to, you know, get in care and, and you know, kick this thing out of their life. I love Okay, that. so... um. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, You and I could probably talk for hours and hours and hours. So you can find Mary Jo at her um, different social media platforms. We're going to take this video. um, It's going to be on the podcast. We also have a video. People who are listening to my podcast, I always um, put the video up on YouTube. And we're also going to chunk this up so that they're smaller segments. So um, you can look forward to some of that. And then until next time, control your brain or it'll control you. Love it. Thank you.